Hello, everyone. Welcome to the first book nook of the year. Happy January. I hope everyone had a lovely Christmas, New Year's, and holidays weren't too cold for you. I'm joined today by Brandon Yingkit Bowie, who is the author of Karma of the Sun, which comes out tomorrow, January 17th. Welcome, Brandon. Thank you so much, Jordan. I appreciate you having me. Oh, I'm so glad we get to talk because this was such a good book for me to have read right before the new year. It's all about kind of new beginnings, explosive starts, and hopefully not the end of the world. Hopefully not. <laughs> hopefully not. <laughs> so uh, the theme of today's talk is Ghosts of Future Blast. And before we get stuck into that, I would just like to hear a little bit more about you. So tell me about yourself, Brandon. Sure. Um, I currently live in Maine, in the United States, and I am originally from California, but I grew up moving a lot every three years to a different home, um, you know, very uh, transitory upbringing. And um, my my um, interests are in writing are, you know, very varied poetry, short stories, plays, and uh, Karma of the Sun is my first novel. And it it really does hit the shelves with a bang, pun not intended or intended. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about Karma of the Sun? Sure. As, as you alluded to, it is about the end of the world. Um, so it's a post-apocalyptic novel, but it is set in Tibet. And it's based on Eastern writings about the end of the world. So it draws from those texts. And the story follows um, a young Tibetan Sherpa who has grown up with this, this shadow of this prophecy of the end of the world. So, you know, you could describe it as the eve of the apocalypse, um, fully expecting um, this to happen. Um, and he, he feels... Um, he feels drawn to search for his father uh, and and out of hopes of seeing him one last time before the apocalypse. And so he sets off on this journey to find his father, see him for one last time before the world ends. But in so doing, potentially um, maybe he finds a way to avert this cataclysm. So you have to read on to see what happens. Exactly. We won't give away any spoilers because it is... It's such a gem of a book to slowly unravel the pieces of this broken world as karma is experiencing it. And I think him traveling through these different people in the Badlands and, and the different nomadic groups that he meets, it's so cool that you get these little pieces of the puzzle of what did happen to this world. Like, why is it in the state that it's in? Yeah, that's right. And I intentionally, you know, didn't want to spell everything out. But you're right, there are little breadcrumbs that you can use to piece it together, because I, I wanted the reader to feel a little bit like the characters do. You know, they're living some time uh, away, removed from, you know, these these crises. Um, so they know something has happened. They know that they're the last bastion of civilization. Um, that they're the, really the only survivors, this this group of people in the Himalayas. Um, and they have this prophecy, which, you know, as I, as I said, is based on, you know, real Eastern writings about seven apocalyptic suns that that destroy the, the, the world. And they are living basically between the sixth and the seventh. So the world is all but destroyed. And they're fully expecting a final, a seventh and final apocalyptic sun um, which which I interpret as nuclear blast. And they don't know where it's coming from, but they have absolutely every reason to expect because it's already happened that they're next. Um, so there's a little bit of a mystery as to why that happened, what got them to this place, and, and what they're going to do to get out of it. Yes, and uh, we mentioned before we started recording that that little flame of hope that you keep throughout the novel is so crucial because while karma is holding onto it the reader is kind of grasping for it like there, there's got to be a way we can't just watch the world die without fighting back at least um so what was your inspiration for this novel 
Yeah, great question. So thinking back, um, I had actually never read a post-apocalyptic well, apocalyptic novel or watched a post-apocalyptic film that was based in in Asia. And, you know, I, I thought that, um, that, you know, there's so much in Eastern eschatological writings and, and legends, so much to draw from that somebody should write, you know, uh, a story set, set in Asia. And at the same time, <clears throat> I had this, you know, picture of, of wanting to write a story, an image of a boy walking towards a mountain. And, um, you know, that image has raised a lot of questions like, who was this young man? Why is he walking there? You know, why are people trying to use him and trying to um, trying to stop him or use him uh, as he as he travels to this mountain? This image of this primordial mountain that has sprung up out of natural forces that's pristine in a world that's been corrupted and it's a last safe sanctuary and then you know while doing this coming across this amazing um prophecy of the seven apocalyptic sons and the stories sort of converged um the other thing was i, I wrote this in a time where a lot of people were feeling very um bleak about the future of the world and i was thinking isn't it interesting that all these world cultures have this creation story, but also believe in the end of the world. You know, um, what does it say about our faith in humanity? And, you know, is this a foregone conclusion that we're going to end up destroying ourselves if, if all these cultures agree on this? And what would it be like to take somebody, a young person just kind of starting off in his life and putting him in the most extreme situation where the world is is basically over and there's going to be one final cataclysm. He's basically um, living with the karma of, you, you know, his the, the past generation's sins and mistakes, right? Through no fault of his own, um, the world is at its end and he's paying the price for it. It's this collective karma of the world, and and whether or not that can be offset by an individual's personal, you know, individual karma. How how do you reconcile this this idea of um, prophecy and fate with um, individual agency and action? Because both of them are, you know, tenets. I think that all these world traditions that espouse like the end of the world, they also believe in you know, good prevailing. They also believe in individual responsibility. I wanted to to set the stage for a story where we could see that play out in an in an extreme way. Oh, I love that. And I think too, it it is a book that has come to the world at a very interesting time in our current world's idea of just how to think about the future. And there's a moment at the very beginning of your novel that uh, you've got these kind of, I think it's more like a coming of age ceremony where the young girls yeah. and boys of Karma's tribe are meeting with this, is he a medicine man, would you say? Or like the kind of mm -hmm. spiritual. Yeah, leader, shaman. The shaman, yeah. And so he's giving them kind of hope for a future that a lot of the older people in that room know isn't going to be a reality and yet why is he giving them this hope for you know a family someday down the road so it's this yeah. beautiful um kind of testament to the resilience of human nature and the 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 drive to just keep going even when everything else seems bleak absolutely yeah i couldn't have said it better myself yeah and so you also mentioned the prophecy within the story. So what role would you say prophecy has in this novel and how does it affect our leading man, Karma? Yeah. Um, so if you think about it, here's a young man who has grown up with this prophecy kind of hanging over his head. They talk about the six apocalyptic suns that have occurred and the seventh is coming. On top of that, he's grown up believing that he is cursed 
know, because of his his father's mistakes, what he he he's told are his father's mistakes. And so he's got a sort of doubly disadvantage, right? Where it's the world's gonna end anyway. We all know we can't change it. Nothing you do matters. And you're cursed. And so I think this prophecy and this um um this this heritage um makes him very um makes him yearn for for something to to be filled a big part of him there's a big piece of him missing and he and he focuses he he focuses in on the fact that he doesn't have a relationship with his father. His father left 10 years ago and he feels like that would fulfill that. So it makes him someone that um, I think is humble. It makes him someone that can grow and change a lot. So he starts off in a position of real weakness, but that becomes his strength. Um, you know, that um, that's what sets him off on this course because everyone else sort of accepts it. Um, it's almost like he has nothing to lose. So just by taking that step of, I want to find, I want to see my father one last time. I don't care if, you know, what, what people say about him, you know, I don't care how uh, futile this is. I just want to do that. The very act of saying that gives him hope because now he wants something, you know, he has a desire outside of this background that he's inherited and, and 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 the lesson in that is you know as long as we're still here as long as there's something that matters that we care about then there's still always a chance for hope and that cannot weigh you know such a big prophecy like the end of the world you know what can one kid do against that and and it's really just this this desire that he has I love that. And actually, you said something that uh, made me form a connection with what you said earlier, where you were saying that the current world uh, in your novel is paying for the sins of their ancestors. And in a very similar way, karma is paying, paying for the perceived sins of his father. And he, oh. like you say, he is this innocent boy. He hasn't really left his village, so he hasn't had the opportunity to do anything so terrible that he should be looked upon with such scorn or, or um, kind of uh, what's that word where he almost represents a bad omen himself mm -hmm. and it's wonderful because he's and no spoilers but he's this character who you just want to root for both changing the uh, karma from his father but also helping change the karma of the world which is a, a much bigger task but if we're starting small at least go for the dad <laughs> yeah yeah that's right yeah he looks at the world in, in a different way um because of you know be, be, because of that um uh lack that he has be, mm -hmm. because um he's he's constantly yearning for for something else and he doesn't know of, you know quite what it is he doesn't know um if he's going to get it um but you know he relates to he he relates to the ghosts that that are haunting the land in the book there's these at night these ghosts come out and you can hear them wailing and these ghosts who are mourning basically the end of the the world because in this in this world where you know there is a belief in reincarnation the end of the world um, represents more than just the end of those who are living if if there is no world to be reincarnated to then really it's the end of of everything um and so you know he can hear these 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 ghosts um the, and everyone can but he also hears a different voice calling to him he, he hears this this horn you know this sound that his father heard and it's and it's calling to him he doesn't know if it's imagined or not um but he sets out you know to to follow along and then in so doing people follow him right even though he's this inexperienced young weak person at first he becomes that reluctant leader in a way just because yeah 
what he so firmly believes. Um, and you've mentioned a few elements of this world that you've created. What kind of research was required in really uh, painting this picture for the reader of post-apocalyptic set in the Himalayas? What kind of research was needed? Um, yeah, I, I read a lot about, um, well, we went to a lot of primary texts, um, you know, Buddhist and Tibetan, you know, um, writings. Um, the Lotus Sutra um, was one, and the Pali Canon. Um, they basically describe these things that, um, you know, the mountain, um, a a stone, a, 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 a prismatic kind of a crystal that contains past, present, and future. You can look at it. You can you can see all these different points in the history of the world. You know, all these concepts that I had. Um, independently just thought of these already existed so I, I went to these primary texts and it was really amazing just to see um, that you know that they were already there um, also spent some time you know in the region so um, you know in various parts of um, in China um, near the, the the Tibetan autonomous region so there was a lot to to draw from uh, so kind of combination of reading and just you know personal travel experiences that is so fascinating because yeah you you quote pieces of the lotus sutra throughout the novel and i just thought that was something that was entirely made for your book but for that to also be these like you say ancient texts oh that gives it so much more depth that's amazing yeah it, it was it was really like quite exciting to, you know, see this um, this overlay of of you know end of the world story um, already kind of spelled out. And like I said, you know, reading it, I thought, wow, somebody should just somebody should write about this. It almost tells itself. Um, but it, it was so it was a process of discovering these, but also just kind of coming up with just creating on my own and then seeing them aligned together that was was pretty neat that's so that's very cool and do you have a favorite scene that you wrote for your novel um favorite scene i i think i i really enjoyed um writing the scenes where you could describe this this landscape because you know, I think I think the the setting is a it's almost like a character in the book, so it's it's the end of the world, and the world is you kind of get this impression that it's heaving its its last breaths, and you see it in you know the fact that it's very unstable. Every night, you know, there are earthquakes. They wake up to a land that's completely reorganized. The earth's wobbling, so. They don't even recognize the stars. They can't navigate, find their ways, their way around. Um, and at the same time, while that's scary and you know tragic, there are moments of incredible beauty in this stark, bleak world. And I and I liked, I really enjoyed writing that and trying to bring out that beauty to make the point that um, you know while a lot of the things that we may love about the world today are gone, we feel that loss. At the same time, we sense that there is a lot of, um, you know, a lot of illusion to the world today that when that's removed and that's lost, that what's, what's remaining is, you know, something that's pure or something that's true. And there's a there was one scene where I was writing about how everything is frozen, everything is dead, but then you see this um, berry of a cotton Easter plant encased in ice, and I loved writing about that. I love that that imagery of life that's still dormant. It looks like everything is dead, but actually there's still life. There's still hope in that bleak world. Or writing about the northern lights. Um, just the the extreme beauty in a stark world. And I, I think that's why a lot of people like 
post-apocalyptic stories. It's not because, you know, they, they, it's not the bleakness of it, but it's just the moments, those glimpses of uh, truth and beauty that can only come, you know, in such a, you know, extreme setting. So those are fun, you know, to write. Yeah. And that's so true because it's, it's not until we're at our lowest that we are also open to the most change or to the most seeing the most beauty. And I think what really struck me reading your book was that there were a lot of terrible people doing terrible things and monopolizing on or taking advantage of people's fear and people's ignorance. Um, but those moments of human kindness where they really had no reason to stick their neck out for karma in the way that they did, or even just um, provide him with a shred of humanity. Those felt so much more real and pure and uh, just beautiful to read because when you're in a dog eat dog world, you don't expect like a pat on the head, you know, <laughs> Yeah, you expect, uh, other dogs to go for the jugular and then you're done but no it was just this really beautiful uh, balance of how do we continue on as society and it is through those little acts of kindness and compassion for people you have no reason to trust yeah that's right there's there's a lot of there's a lot of distrust in the story um, you don't really know who your allies are there are all these different factions all these different tribes clans um you know friends turn out to be foes later on um but you know there's a scene where karma sticks up for this uh, this nun and he he acts you know to his own sort of detriment um but that later on ends up helping him as well and this relationship that that starts that you know becomes kind of the the crux of the whole of the whole plot the whole story and I think there's a little bit of, in his name, karma of, you know, we reap what we sow. So the good that we put out there is the good that comes comes back to us. Um, and, 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 you know, conversely, you have other characters who, you know, don't rise to the occasion, but continue to sink and they continue to fight. And you know, reading it, it's easy to, to wonder like what are they fighting about like there's nothing left this wor the world you know like why are they why do they persist in killing each other and fighting for territory you know the world is is gone you know it's all about gone like why don't they do something else but i think it's a, it's the same question that can be asked of us today you know we have we have so much abundance we have so many resources why do we persist in, you know, this contention? Why do we have so much fighting and conflict? Why don't we use those resources for the greater good? And, um, you know, so he, there, there are bad parts of humanity that whether you're at the end of the world or you're living in a time of abundance that will take advantage or will try to sow contention. But there are people, you know, and the, the point is normal people like karma, who can inspire, you know, good. And, um, you know, we, we haven't really touched on this yet, but there's this whole chosen one prophet, element of the whole prophecy. And, you know, I think an important message of the book is there is no chosen one. Like we all can rise to that occasion. You know, karma is just an ordinary person. And um, we could all find ourselves in the same situation. Yeah, I, and I love that idea because it really puts the the power for great change in everyone's hands. And do we answer that call or do we kind of keep our heads down and keep the status quo as it is, which a lot of us are happy doing, but it takes just takes one person to shake things up, which is such right. a beautiful message, especially in this day and age. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. I agree. Is there any kind of nugget of um, pure excitement or something that you really ge geek out about within your novel that maybe only you would notice or something that you hope other people notice? Yeah, there, uh, 
there, there's, you know, like you mentioned, I did a lot of research um, in, into the world. And so there's a significance in a lot of the, you know, a lot of the things, a lot of the names, um, you know, without, without spoiling any of that, um, you know, a lot of clues in terms of the backstory. One is the name of the, the missile um, that they come across. This is, this is an actual missile. And I think, um, you know, looking into that there it, it gives some some clues as to what has happened to the world so that's one one thing i i kind of geeked out about oh, a lot in doing research i love that um, so that's something that you fellow readers can look out for i'm gonna have to reread and double check <laughs> my <laughs> notes uh what that missile is called but that's very cool um and what kind of projects do you have coming up next oh well um it seems like there are always so many projects and not enough time, but the, the next one I'm working on is a story set in pre-World War II Shanghai. Uh, it goes back between that time and sort of more current day. And it uh, told from the perspective of the Chinese god of theater. So again, you know, combines fa Eastern fable and, 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 and mythology with, um, kind of the real world oh do you have a title or is it still very much a work in progress still working in progress at this at this point ah, and so if yeah. uh we want to learn more or follow you online where do we find you uh website or other social media handles sure um well you can they can follow me on instagram at bowie books on twitter at brandon yk bowie or my website at brandonyinkitbowie.com. Perfect. And I'll put all the information in the little blurb down below. Uh, I have had such a good time chatting with you, even though the topic has been apocalypse and end of the world. It's such an incredible book. And like I said, it's out January 17th. So you can either pre-order it before midnight tonight or go and get a copy of yourself. It's such a little gem of a book, and you must be so proud of yourself. So thank you so much for coming to talk to me about it. Thank you, Jordan. I really enjoyed our conversation, and I appreciate you having me. Mm -hmm.